Spelunky 2 was the follow-up to 2012's HD remake of Spelunky by Derek Yu, which as of three weeks ago was my favorite game of all time. As a veteran of the game since the classic version, I was curious coming into the game how it would play comparatively to HD. After a hundred plus hours so far and tons of secrets unearthed, I've compiled a list of tips and info that both newer and even veteran players may want to know coming into Spelunky 2 for the first time. Keep in mind, none of these tips are major spoilers for the game and all are just mechanics and gameplay tricks you can use to make the game a better and easier experience for yourself. However, if you want to go in pure, completely unspoiled, do not watch this video. Especially at the end where I will be covering slightly more spoilery tips for the bit deeper into the game. Thanks for listening to my rambling, let us get into the rapid fire tips. Get a notepad because none of this is in order. Rule 1 of Spelunky is A, B, C. Always be carrying. Always have something in your hand to easily disarm traps and kill enemies. The critters on the ground no longer trigger traps like in the first game. And keep in mind, you cannot carry bodies or certain larger objects between layers or through doors. But you can carry arrows, rocks, and skulls to the next level. Always be carrying. You are always guaranteed a shop on 1-2 or 1-3 in the dwelling. Utilize this information to prepare on the first floor. Play safely and gather money to spend big on a good shop or play like me and speedrun the level and rob the bastard. But always prepare to see a shop on the middle floors and make sure you at least look at what they have in stock no matter how you decide to approach it. The Ujadai is an item recommended for a lot of later game content similar to the first games, but it's not just useful for that. Always showing up on the wooden hut in 1-2 or 1-3 and requiring the golden key on the same floor, the Ujat Eye shows you gems and hidden items within the world's tiles. Have you ever wondered why there's a random bomb box sitting in the wall? Ujat Eye's got you. Mounts are a wonderful new feature of the game that are a bit divisive depending on who you ask right now, but the World 1 turkeys are incredible for many reasons. You can double jump and get access to treasure for shops, you can float onto spikes like when using a cape, and you can cook them with fire or a bomb to get HP. If lucky on the designated turkey floor with Yang and his turkey pen, you can also get access to the campfire where you can get a torch to cook all the turkeys on the floor. And speaking of cooking, as a great segue, this one is kind of a classic mechanical play, but you can cook bombs in the game to avoid needing sticky bombs. It's a maneuver plenty of people have been using for years in the game. It can take some practice to get used to timing and aiming, but it's a skill worth using and developing in your arsenal. Not much to say here, but basically put the bomb down, pick it up, and toss it at the right time for it to explode when you need it to. Ropes are way more useful in my experience in 2 than in HD, but same as always, you can use ropes in a variety of ways. Throw them up, throw them down, throw them around edges, throw them at the shopkeepers, kill leprechauns and monkeys, disarm traps. Ropes are very good, but remember, they still burn just like in the last game, and you can even burn your own rope to cover up the tracks of your crimes. One of the new mechanics in the game that has both new players and veterans on their asses is the fact that items explode now. More things are destructible. Remember how easy robbing shops in HD was because you could just shoot through everything and kill the world? Not anymore in this one. Jetpacks, power packs, bombs, etc. all interact and explode with each other now. Robbing a bomb store is not as easy as it used to be. Derek changed this to keep veteran players on their toes and approach these situations with better tactics. And trust us, we do. We have to. Spikes are the bane of everyone's existence in their early hours of playing Spelunky, and even for some of us later into playing the game. But some people still don't realize that you can in fact run straight through them, rope down into them, jump into them from the side, and crawl down into them from a one block high situation. Knowing this stuff can help you better avoid unfortunate deaths, however, you will still be killed by spikes. A lot. But less. So there you go. Kali Altars are your best friend. Use them whenever you can. Just simply bring a body, alive or dead, and just yeet it onto the altar. Kali has a built-in favor system that ups in favor points. Damsels have the most favor points when alive. 
one alive damsel grants you a random item, the second alive damsel gets you the powerful Kapala item. You can mix and match damsels and other bodies to reach the goal as well, but keep in mind regular enemies and hired hands are worth less so you'll need more of them over time. And the community hasn't quite completely figured out all the inner workings of Kali's rewards, so as my advice to you, just play like the rest of us and experiment, put random crap on it and see what happens. Whipping in Spelunky 2 has been adjusted, and myself and everyone else took ages to get used to it. Muscle memory was not helpful in this case, sadly. Not only is the whip range shorter and the animation takes longer, but the top whip has also been tightened down to be more balanced. Now your whip doesn't reach as far above your character as it used to. However, to counter this, the back whip has been enhanced. The back whip is so valuable in 2 that it's honestly the best way to take care of enemies like bats. Use this to your advantage. Spelunky 2 introduced two new status effects, Poison and Curse. Both of these can easily be run enders, but can be combated. Poison will slowly drain your HP one at a time, but it can be healed. I tap that forward arrow on your keyboard a few times to avoid being spoiled on this if you want. Okay, by bringing a damsel alive to the end of a level and leaving, you get a kiss from them. This kiss will cure poison. As for curse, it can definitely ruin your run. I won't go into the details of how it works or how to combat it in this video as it is quite a major spoiler and it can be a massive, massive spoiler for some, but just know you can escape it if you experiment enough, so just keep trying. Now let's get back to those pesky shopkeepers. They've gotten a serious buff since the last game and are even more of a hassle. However, robbing shops and being a crime lord is still a viable and extremely strong way to play if you can master it. Ask me. What it comes down to is learning how to rob them and when to rob them. There are a multitude of ways to go about doing it depending on your comfort levels. You can do the whip technique, the bomb throw, the from a distance way, the rope throw, the kill him with his own wear style, and many more. But the type of shop and where it is located all affects how you go about doing it. Approach every shop as a puzzle and give it a go. It won't always work out, but when it does, it feels wonderful. Now let's talk about throwing. And I'm not talking about throwing a runaway like a sack of potatoes like me. I mean throwing stuff, yeeting. It may seem like a trivial tip to give, but hey, it's a good one and it's necessary for Spelunky. Learning the trajectories and weights of certain items can not only gain you profit, but also save your run. Who knew that throwing could save? Something as simple as throwing a rock around a cliff face to kill that bat or snake can help you out. A technique I call the bounce pass has been a method of my play in Spelunky since I first picked up the game, and it will work well in your arsenal. Get a feel for the items and how they weigh, and use that to your advantage. A new feature in Spelunky 2 is the ghost jar, or the curse pot, or the, the evil pot, or the dick pot, or whatever people are calling it now, that appears once on every stage in the game. And within this jar is a single diamond worth a base value of 5,000 gold that, as with everything else, will scale up in value per level survived. This new pot is both the bane and best friend of many players, because while it contains riches, it will automatically summon the ghost upon breaking. Just breaking it, not touching the diamond. This ghost will normally arrive at 3 minutes to warn you that you're taking too long on a level and will chase you down and insta-kill you. Also, the ghost is significantly faster and slightly tweaked from the last game, but this pot can be carried to the end of a level and broken there safely for the diamond as well. Keep it in mind, other enemies and traps can also break the pot too, so be careful and keep it in your vision when it's there. There may be some other hidden secrets with the pot, but I'll let you all experiment and discover if there are on your own. Arrow traps are back and better than ever. Same as always, they will appear in the worst areas ready to snipe you from seemingly across the map, right? Wrong. They actually trigger at 6 blocks, but even with this knowledge they can still be easily avoided with careful play and attention to the level around you. Disarming them as mentioned earlier in the video is still the easiest way to deal with them, but sometimes you're, you know, without something in your hand, and in this situation you should practice your arrow whipping technique and master that, it'll save your life, trust me. And though the traps themselves are mostly unchanged, the arrows are changed now. They now pierce and retain their arrowhead if the enemy that hits are killed. Once it hits something that doesn't die, it'll break. Use this to knock out rows of enemies. 
Once you make it through the first three stages of the dwelling, you'll be met with an interesting level that has a specific design to it. The enemies in loot will always be procedurally generated, but the routes will always be the same. One left and one right, leading you down to a pit with four ladders. And down those ladders you'll see Quillback, or Quill for short. And he's your first boss, and he can catch players off guard the first few times fighting or puzzling him out. Now, you don't need to fight him, you can just bomb through or have him dig the way out for you and leave, but keep in mind if you kill him he drops a cooked turkey and a bomb bag every time. But if you set him on fire or shoot him too aggressively with a shotgun, you'll blow up the bombs. So be careful with how you deal with him. I'll advise you spike shoes and freeze rays are his weakness. Now that you've taken down Quill and are met with a door on each side, you may be curious which one to go into. Derek has stepped up his game this time and added in branching paths. Now it's up to you to choose. Each path has its own uniqueness and challenge depending on what build you're currently running. Personally, I consider left a more challenging pathway on a vanilla run. But now we're going to start talking about potential minor spoiler stuff for the next few tips to round out the video. If you're only wanting early game tips like this and what we've been over, you can skip to the timestamp on the screen or in the description to see the end of the video. Ready? To piggyback off the last tip we covered, the branching paths lead to both the jungle and Volcana. Jungle to the left is a claustrophobic nightmare, filled to the brim with spikes, thorns, hexes, traps. This area caters to a build with either type of boots and bombs more so than the right path. Volcana, on the other hand, is a hellscape of open verticality that is made easier with some form of mobility, a jetpack, a cape, hulk hands, and plenty of ropes to make it a much easier area to scale. Just be aware that if you have a jetpack or any kind of tech pack, they can ignite there and will explode on you. Starting in Area 2, you'll begin to see little leprechauns running around causing a ruckus. They will jump on you much like the monkeys do, stealing money from you and teleporting away. If you can manage to take one out, they'll drop a new item, the four-leafed clover. This item on pickup does two things. It'll increase the ghost timer to five minutes and also spawn a rainbow on the map. Note that it will not prevent the ghost from spawning if the ghost jar breaks, just the natural ghost. The rainbow once bombed, however, will reveal a pot of gold that can be hit multiple times and broken, giving the player thousands of gold and coins. Profitable, but it can be in some hard places. Now while you're exploring the jungle, you may come across some strange NPCs named Parsley, Parsnip, and Parmesan in small background rooms. These ladies are very important on each run going through the jungle. The Veggie Sisters, as I've named them, are some of the best early game NPCs you can meet on your run. And depending on how many you rescue in a run, you'll receive a different reward on the following area. Each sister appears in the same level every time. Parsley on 2-2, Parsnip on 2-3, and Parmesan on 2-4. So keep an eye out. One sister equals a rope pile, two equals a bomb bag, and all three rescued equals a bomb box. And for those of you who are exploring Volcana on the other hand, there are some particulars here you may also run into. On every 2-1 Volcana floor you'll see a back door with a key and also a pit with a locked door. Within this door you'll find a familiar face from Spelunky HD, Mr. Horsing himself, and he'll give you a diamond and tell you some foreshadowing information, which we won't necessarily get into on this video. Now you might be wondering what letting him out will do. And we'll get to that shortly, just know that if you plan on continuing this path, then taking the time to let him out will be worth it. Now let's talk about that Ujad eye, now that people who didn't want potential spoilers are gone. What does it do? What can I do with it? In Spelunky HD it found the black market, is that still true? Aha, Pilgrim. Indeed it is. But that's not all. Yes, in the jungle you can indeed find the black market in the same way we did in HD, wait for it to blink find the blinking, and then bomb. However, this black market isn't its own stage like an HD, but a backstage, so the timer is still going. You do get a clover at the start though, so that's nice, but don't hesitate. For the folks who've been exploring Volcana, on the other hand, and found the giant purple drill, you may have wondered, what does this do? Well, stand on the platform and activate your eye. This will dig through the stage, down to another layer, and another sub-area, similar to the black market, and welcome to Vlad's Castle, a haunting, organ-booming area reminiscent of the same castle from HD, only grander. Within here you'll find many spikes, arrow traps, a new character, vampires, plenty of hired hands, and also Mr. Vlad himself resting at the top, 
Now he's much different than when we met him before. He now teleports like the Croc Men. However, you remember that Mr. Horsing from just earlier on 2 1? Yes. If you save him, he will be there and snipe Vlad out of the air and insta kill him, granting you access to both the crown and Vlad's cape. Unless, of course, Derek blocks his shot, but that's a different story. But don't worry! Science was done, and you can indeed kill Vlad with Horsing's arrow and still get the task done. Derek! Derek! He missed! He... No, does that mean I don't get it? Does that mean I, I didn't do it? Because he missed? What if I kill him with your own arrow? Does that count? Yes! It worked! This won't be the last time you see Mr. Horsing, but for now we'll leave him savoring the kill. Interesting note here though, Vlad's cape also had a change made to it from Spelunky HD that many will love. Not only does it act as a double jump and a cape as always, but now it doubles the blood things drop, making it a must-have for Kapala. And last but not least, and probably the most spoilery of all the tips in the video, even though it's available in Area 1, The Dwelling. So turn back now if you don't wish to be spoiled. Click this timestamp or the one in the description, I'll give you a second. On level 1-4, if you remove the majority of the middle blocks either from quill rolling or bombing them yourself, you'll discover a small face mural that might seem very familiar to you astute folks. This is a cursed door, and can only be opened to the player arrives cursed. Now, how on earth do you curse yourself this early in the game? Well, you can have the ghost pot drop on you and, well, done is done. Once you're cursed and you get here, you'll be able to enter a small ghost shop with three gift boxes costing 20,000 gold each. The loot from my experience is completely random. On one run I got a hover pack, a bag of 12 bombs and ropes, and a kapala of all things. But the other time I just got a web gun. I haven't tested if the loot pool is always similar like a three shell Monty or not, but just know that this little secret is here, and Derek is way too damn good at making games. And that'll just about do it for the video guys. My main hope for this video was to inform at least each viewer one thing about the game they didn't know, and to just be helpful to my fellow Spelunkers. I know some of the tips are more technical and some are more on the simple side, but I wanted to make sure there was something here for everyone. As a Spelunky veteran myself, I'm still getting surprised by the game every day I play it. And I cannot wait to continue unlocking the world and mechanics that Derek has made for us. So hit that like button, comment the tip that you learned from the most, and subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Lastly, I'd just like to thank Derek Yu for continuing to prove why he's my favorite developer. Thank you, Derek, and I'll see you guys next time.